playing with your food. That's the mark of a maker. The KitchenAid stand mixer and attachments. Welcome to the British Library food season, generously supported by KitchenAid. I'm Angela Clutton, I'm the guest director of the food season and um, it's been my incredible pleasure this year to have worked with Polly Russell who's the founder of the season and its curator for the three years that's been running and together we've programmed this season of events. Um, you're about to watch the second event of our Saturday afternoon. It's an event called Beyond the Food Bank, exploring initiatives which are really um, empowering communities through food and um, we've just finished a session which we're looking at food solutions and problems in a slightly different way. We have a chair, Stephen Armstrong, who will be introducing our wonderful panel, um, but I'm going to introduce Stephen. So Stephen is a journalist and author. He writes for Sunday Times, The Daily Telegraph, Wired and The Guardian. He's written five non-fiction books, including The New Poverty, for which he travelled across Britain to tell the stories of those who are most vulnerable. Before I hand over to Stephen, just a little bit of housekeeping. You can all ask questions as we go along. They'll be dealt with towards the end of the session. But if you scroll up on your screen, you can see where you can put your questions in. You can join in the conversation on social media. All the handles are visible. You can find out more about our speakers too. There are bios all there. And there is also a bookshop where you can have a look and see titles written by our guests. So uh, I think the only thing to do now is hand over to you, Stephen, and I hope you all enjoy it. Thank you very much. Um, so what I'm going to do briefly is introduce our panel by name, but then ask them one at a time to explain the remarkable projects that they've uh, really bootstrapped in, in so many imaginative and unusual different ways, but all using food to, to effectively change the world, really. So we have Barney Horton, um, who's the founder and director of Bristol Square Food Foundation. We have Mary Brennan, uh, who's the co-founder of Community Unity in Leeds and the Cross Green Growing Together. We have Jess Thompson, who's the founder of My Grateful. And we have Kemi Akinola, who is the founder and managing director of Be Enriched and the People, Bricks and People's Kitchen. So, um, so Barney, perhaps you could talk a bit about uh, Bristol Square Food Foundation, how you came to do it and, and what your work involves. Yeah, hi there. Um, yeah, so we... Um, began Square Food Foundation in, in 2011. I think it's about the same time as the Brits and Kitchen actually uh, that Kemi is involved in. So it's been going for, for now for um, 11 years basically. No, whatever it is, I can't, I can't think even. Um, and we're based in South Bristol, which uh, is um, known as a deprived part of uh, the city of Bristol, which is of course a a city well known for its food culture and um, and its sort of diverse uh, and very eclectic restaurants and and uh, and food projects. Um, we're in um, in a community centre which is uh, which used to be a, a secondary school, and we're in the school kitchen. So we occupy a very um, appropriate space in a way for for a cookery school. Um, and we're a charity uh, and we've been a charity I think now for about four or five years. Um, our kind of mission is really uh, our sort of strap line is to teach uh, people uh, from all walks of life to, go to cook good food from scratch um, and as we all know all of us on the panel and everybody involved in this conversation knows that there's a great deal more to, uh, to that than just cooking and, and eating food. And I'm sure we're going to be talking a bit about that um, later. Um, we work with quite a number of different groups and organisations in the city. So we work with care homes, uh, with sex workers, with uh, young people. Uh, with We have a sort of Monday morning over 55s uh, club. Uh, we work with um, young people who aren't in educational training. Um, and we also work with children's food clubs. Um, but perhaps at the heart of everything uh, we're doing at the moment is a project with a primary school just across the road from, um, from Square Food Foundation, uh, which in itself uh, has huge uh, deprivation problems on almost every indice that you would be able to look at. Mary, why don't you pick up um, and talk about your route to the phenomenal 
a set of you know adventures you've been on to get here. I'm Mary Brennan and I live in an area of Leeds called Cross Green. It's made up of three areas, Cross Green, Richmond the Hill and East End Park. But they're all quite, they're all linked to each other, but people seem to live quite separately, you know, and stay in their own parts. We formed a group called Community Unity um, 17 years ago now, and we've been a charity for about eight years and in this we did family events, family parties, play schemes um, with the local children and then the housing stock in our area seemed to change quite dramatically and quickly and a lot of the through the big old Victorian through terraces would turned into HMOs. So there were a lot of single people living very lonely lives. And we noticed that quite a lot of them was hungry at times. So as a group, we just started buying extra tins and so on in the supermarket and handing them out um, at my front door at that time. And we thought this was a really sad situation, you know, for people's dignity that we were doing it this way. So we asked St Hilda's Church in Cross Green if we could use their community room and they welcomed us for no charge to come in. So we started a Wednesday, the Wednesday meals, and we cooked a meal um, together, more or less, uh, we didn't plan it that way, but we opened the door at 10, 10 o'clock to prepare for 12 o'clock for everyone to eat. But everyone came at 10 o'clock, so it worked out quite well. We all did it together, then we all ate together. And that we've been doing that for nine years in January. And it's a really nice, a really nice day. It's quite intergenerational. We've never advertised it. At first, we just invited people. Then other people invited other people. And it's just gone from there. And then we was approached about seven years ago by Hyde Park Source, a not-for-profit or garden or gardening organisation in Leeds, um, to grow on the railway bridge, which we did, which took off really well. And as it was a, a walkthrough for the estate, for people to get from one part of the estate to the other and to the school, it worked really well because then everybody passing, you know, um, got involved. And then we was offered um, a bigger piece of land by the council that had, oh, that had at one time had some old garages there. There was still one person using one of the garages. And so we were able to have three of the garages, one for a social space, and the other two for our tools. Um, it took us a long, long time to clear the area. It were really bad. You know, there were carpets, there were everything. And this is on another railway. We're still on a, a railway embankment. And at the time we were having a group repair grant in the area. So they helped us clear, else we'd still be there clearing now, I think. So we have, um, we've, that's now, last year we knocked the garages down and we, with the help of High Park Source, they helped us fund to get some containers. So it was actually two containers and they refurbished them and we have a kitchen. So, um, that's been really good for us 
because now because the land is quite big so we have enough we can grow we can grow plenty of produce and share plenty of produce and we the children always came on Thursdays when everybody gardened the children joined in but for the last um, two years now um, Hyde Park Source again helped us out and got us some funding for some activity workers. So now we can, the children can have their own time as well and learn a bit, you know, learn more about the garden and so on. And we have quite a lot of fun. It's really good. It's really good time, you know, in the six weeks holidays, we have some real fun there. And now we've got our hub. Uh, it were quite different, obviously, this year. Because, so we could, instead of trying to cook it outside, we could just um, harvest our food, bring it in and cook with that. And um, so all the children got involved cooking, washing up, eating the food. It was, it's really good, the Healthy Holidays Scheme. We've been really blessed with Community Foundation helping us with that funding. It's been a massive asset to the community, especially because we live in a community that's quite transitional. And for our refugees and asylum seekers, for them to come when they do live here, uh, when they're in our area, it helps, you know, with the English and, you know, some really lovely friendships have formed that wouldn't have happened, you know, if we didn't have this, because obviously now the, um, they can't all go to school in our area because of the, the enough places for everyone's school in the same area. So this gives them an opportunity as well to meet children from other schools, you know, and they bring the friends along and the parents come along and sometimes the parents bring us food that they've cooked, you know, that we wouldn't normally eat. So it's, it all works in quite well because then we can feed people on a Wednesday and ask them to work on a Thursday. So it, it, it's good for us. Brilliant. Thank you, Mary. Um, Kemi, tell us about, tell us about your route. I mean, both be enriched in people's um, kitchen, which are sort of meshed now, I think. Um, yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, um, firstly, just uh, thank you, British Library, for inviting me to, to be a speaker on um, in this, in this um talk about community and culture and i think that's the essence really of of the enriched we initially set up the organization actually as a youth charity um we were working with um young people who were seeking asylum um the, i worked for another charity and um all the young people who who ha had british passports were basically allowed to do overseas projects and the young people who were seeking asylum had to stay in the UK. So I set up a project where um, I would take them to Scotland, which really is another country, but it's also not another country. So they didn't have to leave uh, via plane. Um, and we, you know, we just got a train and we went up to Scotland for a week. And uh, I wasn't interested in, in food myself too much at that point in time, but for some reason though, we went to work with a charity in, in Leith in Scotland that um, used gardening and growing as a way of um, involving young people with learning difficulties and other young people who who um, were in the care system over there and, and, and engaging them. So we went to work up there and that was a really like wonderful experience for those young people, which kind of opened my eyes to like some of the limitations of, well, soon to be our limitations <laughs> of, of having a, a British passport. So, um, so um, leaving leaving that organisation, um, I had a I basically had a charity and I had to do something with it. Well, actually, I didn't get my charity status until two years ago, but I had an organisation. Um, 
and it came to my attention uh, that there was all, all this food being thrown away uh, in some of our local uh it, I live in Tooting, the best place on earth. And um, it came to my attention, there was all this food being thrown away at one of the local supermarkets. And at that time, having uh, experienced hunger very recently in that period myself, um, it seemed like a great idea as a way of bringing people together. So, you know, community and culture, we were all about the community before the food. So was we set up a, a, a meal, it was supposed to be once a month, bringing people, local people together, just to enjoy a, a lovely a lovely hot meal cooked by, by volunteers. Not a new idea at all. Uh, loads of people do it all around the country. Um, so I can't claim that as a, like my idea. Um, so we set that project up, but what, and, um, what I was really important to me was that young people that wouldn't normally be engaged in that sort of activity would be inv involved. So um, I was mentoring young people who were at risk of um, violence at that point in time. Uh, I know they call them young offenders, but a lot of them haven't actually offended. So, um, so it was like some of those young people and it was about taking them out of uh, just gardening and painting walls, which is normally the kind of jobs that they get given and bringing them into the kitchen. The young people that I mentored quite often would tell me that they were told by another child how to do the crime better the next time. And that was what really struck me as that that's not some that's that shouldn't be happening. So we brought them into the kitchen and we made them like make pastry and do very delicate things and they would get things wrong and they would cry and you would see these big, big boys with muscles crying because the pastry didn't come out the way that they want it, or they didn't think that like the meal had had been presented in the right possible way. And they were presenting food to a lot of people of the similar age of people uh, that they had perpetrated their crimes against if they had or, you know, um, or hadn't, maybe they had really. Um, and it was as if some of the older people who were coming to these meals knew that what they needed was this kind of encouragement. So they would like make them sit down in front of them. I never told any of the older people any of this. And it would make them sit down in front of them and then speak to them about their lives again it made these boys mainly boys they would run outside and start crying and just be like i can't believe i did that to someone of this person's age so that was great um really in terms of reparations but the project was really only supposed to last three months and then it's now eight years nine years um because word got out that's that's really how i put it word got out and other organizations asked us will you come and do a project with us? Will you do a project with us? And we realized that although our project was mainly about, or we set it up about uh, community and our strap line is enriching community through food. Uh, we realized that we were also really affecting change when it came to hunger. And after hunger came the community building. Um, shall I stop there? Well, um, can you talk about the bus? I think the bus is such oh, a brilliant bus. Right. Well, OK, so nine years on. So we've got three community meals, uh, Tooting, Elephant and Castle, Battersea, um, one, only one of which is in operation right now. Um, and the other thing, I mean, as, as time has gone on, we've been part of the Sustainable Food Cities movement and we've been looking at access to food. So, we, you know, we ask these people regularly, um, do you have access to food? Do you have money? so on and so forth. I mean, it became apparent that the issues really are around uh, the cost of food and access to food. So what better way to bring food to people than a double-decker bus that we can literally drive to them, providing the food that they need at a reasonable cost, which is like two thirds cheaper than in the supermarket and um, allow people to, to buy food in a very, um, uh, what do you call it, with, we, you know, without the stigma of having to go to a food bank, but you're able to pay for your food with a cafe on the top and you're also doing a bit of food cooking on the bottom floor and we should be getting the keys next week. Yay! And you also <laughs> have the citizens' advice and doctors and stuff upstairs at the bus, so people, I think what you said is when people's bellies are full, that's when they can start to worry about the other parts of their life sometimes. What he said. <laughs> there we go. Um, so, Jess, uh, how, tell us about my grateful and how you got how you came up with the idea and what what you're doing now. Um, okay, hello everybody. Um, 
So My Great Four is a social enterprise where refugees teach their traditional cuisines to paying customers. Um, so I think it was five years ago, I graduated from university, went out to teach English for the British Council in a Spanish enclave in Morocco uh, called Seita. I'd never heard of it before, but I was just allocated there. Um, when I got there, I realized there was a huge humanitarian crisis happening. The enclave has a 100 meter high fence that migrants from all over Africa will try and climb over and it's like a gateway into Europe. Um, but they're held there in detention camps. I got very involved in the charity work there. Um, lots of people coming over by sea. Uh, I had to attend a lot of funerals of people that we couldn't identify because they were trying to make this journey into Europe. Um, and I think I became quite emotionally traumatized by the experience just kind of being on the front line of the refugee crisis and hearing about the reasons why people were risking their lives to get into Europe. Um, I was then in Dunkirk refugee camp looking after families that had been there for over five years living in slum conditions uh, in one of the richest countries in the world. Um, so I think I was feeling quite angry about the sort of injustice of people are being forced to leave their homes and then there's no kind of safe place for them to rebuild their lives. Um, I then came back to the UK. I was working in a refugee charity in East London uh, at running a time bank skill exchange project. Um, and so one particular day I was asking a group of 10 refugee women, what skill would you like to share with your community? Uh, and they were all women who were highly qualified, had been forced to leave their countries, uh, left behind successful careers and were unemployed in the UK often because of language barriers and because their qualifications weren't recognized. Um, and as we went around the room, every single one of them said, I'd really love to teach my community my traditional cooking, because that's something I feel very confident with. Um, so that was when I had the idea, well, why don't we try and make this your job? Um, so that was three years ago, and we've now run 900 cookery classes. Um, we have 45 chefs. Um, so the idea is any refugee with a passion for cooking, we train them to become a professional cookery class teacher. Uh, and the main benefit that we see is kind of the confidence that it brings to them in sharing their skills and being the leader and the teacher, developing their English skills. Um, a lot of them will then go on to pursue careers in the food industry or setting up their own business. Um, currently half of our chefs don't have the right to work because they're asylum seekers um, and that is also really um, that's kind of where we see the most benefit at the moment is just giving them uh, a sense of dignity through a really difficult time um, so yeah to give an example our Nigerian chef um, she had been waiting for over 18 years to get her status in the UK and taught her first cookery class and said it was like this beautiful healing moment for her where she remembered that she was a human that um, could really offer something and was she I think it was the, what she said was she felt very celebrated and um, yeah I think that's I didn't have a background in food at all but um, the same time that I sat in my grateful was also um, the Brexit vote and a lot of stuff in the news around um, migrants being an issue for society and that was something that I didn't agree with at all so I also have observed how food kind of unites people um, it's for us we find the cookery classes are a really good way to challenge negative perceptions of migration because it offers this very positive interaction where people unite over food um, rather than thinking about their differences um, yeah and I think what's been good about the model is that Pre-COVID, 85% of our income came from the cookery class sales. So we operate as a business. Um, not so easy now, but um, we are a registered charity, but it has been a real success in terms of how a social enterprise model can get its income from sales rather than grants. Brilliant. And so for all of you, really, um, maybe in a different order, maybe in, on my screen it goes... Um, Kemi, Jess, Mary, and Barney. So let's do it in that order. Uh, food, all of you almost, perhaps with the exception of Barney, almost came to food almost accidentally, not quite, but it wasn't necessarily what you were doing at the beginning. 
do you, what is it about food that allows you to do all the other stuff that allows you to build community draw people together add all this other stuff you know restore self-esteem unite people in a way that if you were you know handing out books perhaps you might not have the same response what do you feel what's particularly special about the relationship people have with food and with people who, who share food Kimmy, would you um i think that well food is a basic need you need food you need warmth you need shelter so if you satisfy one of those needs then i think people feel like they're ready to open up i definitely find that when people have sat sit down at a community meal and they eat it's after they've eaten that they feel ready to talk or even while they're eating there's something about the the ritual of eating in a group as well it's like one of the most natural things that that humans do really sit down together and break bread um i feel that that really restores a lot of humanity for um and it's not just elderly people that that come to our meals we have like people at risk of homelessness homeless people um recovering from substance abuse and uh just people who just live nearby and are pretty lonely a lot of old um, no middle-aged white ma males as well who uh, don't know how to cook they also turn up to eat um and you know everyone is it's just a hodgepodge of people just sat around and you just feel able to talk i think and and then from that what we use it as is a way to um deal for it to signpost people to deal with other issues and things that they may they may have jess what how about you what's what's food what's this what is food special um I think for the group that I work with, particularly when English, it's not so easy for them to communicate with the host nation in English. Um, food is like a language in itself. So um, that's been really nice, kind of seeing how relationships can develop through uh, teaching others about your food. Um, kind of the, everyone loves food. So there's that like instant gratitude and connection that people feel when um, they try someone's food. Um, yeah, so I think it's more about the, it being like this, um, food being a uniting thing that everyone can enjoy. Um, and I think even like whenever I tell people about the My Grateful Cookery classes, it's very rare that someone says, oh, I don't want to go to that because everyone likes to eat. They might not like to cook necessarily, but they definitely like to eat. So um, I think it's just, it's one thing that everyone can get involved with. Thank you. Mary, would, how, why is food the way that you've connected with people, do you think? Um, everybody likes eating, everybody needs to eat. But I think when it's in a such a relaxed atmosphere that people know they can just come. You know, it's not out there, you can just pop in it becomes very intergenerational. So the younger ones can learn from the older ones and vice versa. And it just becomes something that everyone can look forward to from any walk of life. You know, just come join in. And I think that's what makes so many unlikely friendships formed and changes people's perceptions of different people. And it just naturally brings everyone together in a natural way. You know, not in a uniform way. It's just a natural thing that everybody comes through that door and gets a welcome, gets a meal, gets someone to sit next to, to talk to. So it just, it works out really well. I think that food is the center of most things. It's what we all do as families. So then, who's in your room? They become your family. And that's the feeling you create and everyone's relaxed, eats and gets on with it. Brilliant. Barney, what about you? I was just, I was just echoing everyone else's as, as perceptions of what, of what changes, what, what happens when people uh, cook and eat together. There's something about the psychology of it and we use words like empowerment uh, and confidence and inclusion, and they're all real. They become real in the act of cooking and eating together. Um, and it, it, it gets rid of so many uh, inhibitions, uh, 
And in, in the case of the work that we do in Bristol, it's really about, it, we're working with a lot of people who don't have any kind of voice, who, who are, are not used to talking about anything, least of all themselves and, and, or, or each other. And sitting around a table or cooking together enables that conversation to begin. And so, so, and that of course is the beginning of something else. It's a gateway into understanding other things about each other. Uh, it's about trust and about respect. Uh, and it's about removing those areas of, of shame and, uh, and despair. So there's something about the simple act of cooking and eating, which, which brings uh, hope as well. So thank you. Now, now we're in the, um, the COVID years and in one sense, the need to come together has never been more important, but it's much, much harder. And also we're finding a lot of people who are falling through the gaps, who are, who are reaching the end of the furlough, who have found their lives made immeasurably harder by the process of the virus. And I wondered what effect you've noticed things that you can't do that you used to do things that you ha now have to do you know just to keep think people going what what effect has covid had on the way that you work um and maybe start with you jess and then go kemi barney mary um so pre-lockdown we were running 80 cookery classes a month with the my grateful the my grateful chefs were teaching the public um, but we had to cancel all of them. So that was uh, quite a scary time. Um, but the whole of the, the sort of chef community agreed that they wanted to try teaching cookery classes online. Um, so within a few weeks, we actually were teaching all, we were running 10 online cookery classes a week. Um, I think we kind of caught the wave of the Zoom um, craze because all our classes were selling out. I guess everyone was in lockdown quite bored. Um, so people would buy their own ingredients. One of our chefs would teach um, a dinner, how to cook it around an hour and a half. Um, so that was going well. And then in July, people started going to the pubs. Everyone got a bit fed up of Zoom. So now online classes are not selling so well. Um, can't really go back to running real life classes just yet. So yeah, it's a bit of, um, it, what's challenging is that we really want to keep our community um, earning money, but also connected and out of isolation. So um, it's just quite hard to do that, um, especially with all the different regulations changing. And so making plans is difficult. Um, yeah, but don't want to sound too negative, but it is a, <laughs> it's a challenging time. Yeah. Kevin, how about you? Um, so I'm also involved in another um, organization, a social, ent social enterprise, Brixton People's Kitchen. And uh, what the difference between both organizations is uh, Being Rich goes into areas and, and sets up these community meals. Uh, Brixton People's Kitchen as a social enterprise um, has a cafe space in, in Vauxhall, uh, the aim of which is to edu um, help train people and educate people in the, in the um, hospitality industry. So what we did is we brought both of these organizations together because that meant that we had a, a venue and we actually did a lot of um, we got some funding from charities, councils, and we managed to, to send food out, hot food out to people, as well as um, buying some food and using surplus food to sell people, to send people um, like packages of food. So we had like, in the height of the lockdown, we had 400 volunteers helping us on a, on a, on a weekly basis, which was incredible. Um, and I can't even believe that we did it. I haven't even had time to really process everything that happened there. Um, and so we sent out something like five or 6,000 boxes of food. Um, some of them with, with the council as well, um, out to people around Lambeth and Wandsworth, which was amazing, uh, but obviously not, doesn't have, it's not sustainable. So uh, what we did is convert our cafe, the cafe, into a, 
a community shop. Again, thinking of those ideas around dignity and allowing people choice, because that was something that wasn't very uh, clear. Well, it wasn't there at all when people were just being sent these boxes of food. So we turned it into a community shop, bought our own food, uh, made sure that there was some culturally relevant food available for people to buy. And I mean, we make a total loss on it, but it's fine because it's propped up by by grants and we're enabling people to eat long term. And um, what we have seen is that um, people who, a lot of people who are uh, like Uber drivers, a lot of them started coming to shop with us. Um, security guards were shopping with us because they were all out of work. So, but they also didn't have enough money so they were able to purchase like the things that they needed for a fiver it's like literally giving it away um for a fiver and we haven't seen an end to that a lot of parents as well um parents with young children or with multiple children coming to like do their weekly shop with us um i don't see that disappearing in fact i see that becoming more and what we have to do as a, a organization is work out how we can make it sustainable or find someone to just like Give us loads of money. <laughs> Bonnie, how about you? Um, well, as soon as lockdown uh, began, um, obviously all our classes ended, as Jess was saying as well. Um, uh, and so what we started was to um, feed the families of children who would have otherwise been getting free school meals. Uh, we started feeding maybe 20 or so families a day um, and then ended up within about three weeks um, feeding maybe 300, basically 300 uh, people one way or another every day, uh, a two course meal. And we were supported amazingly by uh, chefs who obviously didn't have any work and also by restaurants who had a lot of ingredients in their freezers and, and fridges and store cupboards. And so we were able to sort of draw on, on, on all that. Um, uh, it, was, it was a really incredible moment in time when it felt like uh, the whole city, and I know it wasn't quite like that, came together with a sort of common purpose and put value on, on humanity and food uh, in the same moment. Um, it was, you know, people in production, in retail, uh, local growers, uh, and, and of course restaurants. Um, uh, and it felt like uh, that there was something in, certainly in Bristol, felt like it had the potential to become something uh, much stronger. It, was, it felt like there was a foundation of, of a new uh, food culture in the city. Uh, I don't know, For, so now we are, we've, We've turned a lot of what we're doing into working with with uh, with the parents of some of the children in the school who are helping us continue to produce these meals, not on such a, uh, um, a volume as we as we were doing. We've also introduced a sort of DIY meal kits um, where we do a little video uh, and send it out to the school, and they come and pick up um, the kits, and then they look at the video and get the recipe and so on. So it's kind of a move slightly beyond just giving uh, the families uh, ready-made meals. Um, but certainly we benefited from uh, a connection with the hospitality industry, which I feel uh, has a future. And we are really looking to work uh, with restaurants in the future now uh, to see if we can kind of build on that, on that relationship. Brilliant. Mary, how about you? How has COVID affected um, we had to stop the Wednesday meal because the room, uh, the church's community room, it isn't that big, even though we managed to fit everybody in on, a, on the Wednesdays previous to COVID. But so we have, um, we started off Monday, Wednesday and Friday, we gave out food. It was very important to us that we gave out fresh food instead of just handing people a package with tins in and dried food. So we were, we got funding and we gave out um, some meat, um, 
vegetables, fresh fruit, and then fresh bread, fresh milk, and added some tins to it to last them through. And we was doing that Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And now we just do it on Wednesday and Friday. We don't know how long we're going to be able to sustain it. And at the moment for us in Leeds, it's not, it's not any going to be any easier on people because we're in a strict from midnight last night, we've gone into a stricter lockdown. But so on some people, it it's gonna be really tough. And I think a lot of the older people, uh, we used to deliver to them. So a lot of the older people, um, some of them it, want the fact of the food, the families, if they were lucky enough to have a family, they drop the food for them, you know, at the doorstep. But for some, it want the food, it would just seen a different face, you know, from the end of the path in the week and so on. And um, it was very, very difficult for single parents, I felt at first, because they couldn't take the younger children to the supermarkets. So that's why we needed to, you know, have the fresh food. And like now, some people that we did feed have come off the furlough and gone back to work. But we feel now that the furlough is finishing, but there'll be so many more people that don't have a job at all. Mm. So it's pretty difficult and it's been pretty difficult on the older generation as well as the younger children as well because the older people have stayed in so long that they they can't walk as well and they've got more frightened to go out the younger children are just totally confused why they can't come and do things but I think it's just a matter of keeping going and keeping everybody's spirits up, our lovely tomatoes, fed everybody last Wednesday. <laughs> we managed to give everybody some homegrown tomatoes and we had a queue of about 30 and that was single, at about 10 single, I would say, 10 to 15 single people and 30 families. Brilliant. So it's, it's quite a lot of people that are going without food at the, this moment in time, I would think, not just where I live, I mean, everywhere. Well, that, that leads us neatly onto the first of our audience questions. We've got a lot of audience questions, actually, thank you very much. And um, particularly the one that uh, 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 I'm gonna start with because it, it's, it's a nice segue and I'm always grateful for a segue. Um, so we, and I, what I might do just to try and get as many of the questions answered as possible so that people we only got 15 minutes is to ask a couple of them together because they sort of cover the same ground um the first one that's twinned is what would you want people who are lucky enough to be food secure to understand about the impact of food poverty on people's lives and i guess that's whether that's long term or this you know current um sudden shock and do you think what do you think the role of government or local authorities should be in supporting initiatives like yours in tackling that? So I don't know if, if um, all of you have a point or whether maybe two of you wanted to answer that or uh, does anyone feel particularly strongly that they'd like to talk about the the? OK, brilliant. Kenny, do you want to start and then we'll do someone else um, and then we'll move on to the next question. So, yeah, what would you want people who are lucky enough to be food secure to understand? And what do you think should be the role of government or local authorities? I'll be very short. So it'll be fine. I think people who are food secure have a misguided idea that people who are food insecure don't know how to budget. In fact, that's inaccurate. They know how to budget incredibly well. They have so much to 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 like balance and the fact that they're they've chosen not to eat because they've had to pay all their other bills and things doesn't mean that they don't know how to manage money at all. And I think government needs to take a responsibility for food insecurity. We're, we're here for organisations and um, none of us are a government organisation because they won't take responsibility. Food should be a human right, in my opinion. I agree. Right. I agree. Would anyone have anything to add to that? Would, Barney, do you want to I, add? I, oh, I was just going to say, I think 
what uh, Food Secure people can do best of all, as far as I'm concerned, is come and work with us at Square Food Foundation as a volunteer, because that does so many things on so many levels. We probably have about 60 volunteers you know, on our database who come on a regular basis, and they are part of of the community of Square Food and they learn and we learn and it's a really, really important connection. So if anybody has the time, get involved in any one of the projects that, who are on this panel or indeed anyone that they might be near. So it's, it's a, it's a, but I, yeah. And, and as for, oh yeah, I was gonna say something about, about, about policy. I think what, what on top of my wish list uh, for this country is that we have a food literate government uh, and a food literate um, public health policy. At the moment it isn't and I feel that would that would uh, make a big difference to the, the whole connection and the reality of food poverty. And actually that is another beautiful segue, lovely segue, to uh, a question which is great discussion and amazing projects. Thank you very much, questioner. Um, really inspiring. What change in terms of food policy or attitudes towards food would the panel like to see happen in this country? And Jess, should we start with you and then maybe Mary, see what you think? So what, yeah, what change in terms of food policy or attitudes towards food would you like to see happen in this country? Jess. You may be on mute. Um, I mean, I guess where my grateful is involved in this the sort of policy work is more around destitution which is like an extreme well just that a lot of our chefs aren't eligible to benefits and they don't have the right to work so it's um a lot of them wouldn't be able to feed themselves so that kind of i think there's just generally a lot of the government needs to make sure that the policies that they introduce enable people to feed themselves um and yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it, it feels like in terms of where my grateful differs as an organisation is that we, not, we are not necessarily, like we haven't been feeding people during the pandemic or kind of tackling the poorer communities that aren't able to feed themselves. Um, our mission is more around integration. So we are where refugees teach essentially the middle classes or the anxious middle um, who may be sceptical about migration and we are challenging those negative perceptions um so i feel like i have slightly less to say on the food policy front i've got another question for you later so okay. there's one <laughs> um mary what about you do you do you think that there, there needs to be a change in terms of food policy or attitudes towards food in this country? a change in the policies towards the benefit system in the lack of um space in between going from one benefit to another People waiting for universal credit, eight weeks. People, when they, we first start, uh, went into the pandemic, being 3,000 in the queue on the telephone. And, you know, everyone talks about the choice between heating your home and eating food. Well, that's wrong. There shouldn't be any choices there. Mm. I feel that people should be able to do both. I don't feel it's right that parents are having to go to bed at the same time as the children, because that's uh, um, how far the money will go. And I, I totally agree that it isn't people's inability to budget, it's the inability to have enough money to live on. I'm not talking about any extras. I'm speaking about having just sufficient money to live on. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we have a question from someone who's also watching the previous session, which was about the problem with the food system as a whole. And they ask, how do you weigh up the importance of people having access to food, even if that food is cheap and not nutritious, or the importance of food being sustainable, fairly sourced and ethical? Is there a conflict between just getting the food out to people, no matter how low grade it is, or should we be, you know, 
should we be making sure that that food is sustainable for us or sustainable? I mean, given from what you guys have all said, I, I can sort of guess, I think, your answers, but why don't you all take, take that one and uh, see what you have to say? Uh, Barney, should we start with you and then Mary, then Jess, then Kim? I, d I don't think there's a contradiction. I, of course, would say that I think the food should be in itself uh, coming from a good place and sustainable and all the rest of it. And I was thinking okay. that there was a, a UN... Uh, conference last year on the Convention of the Rights of the Child and I was reading it this morning and it was about getting a legal framework to protect a child's right uh, to a healthy food environment and one of the things they said and I'll read it out is if we are to meet the malnutrition challenge full-on we need a scaled-up approach that puts children's nutritional rights at the heart of food systems and prioritizes nutrition outcomes and other systems. So they're talking about food systems bottom up, uh, as well as as well as the as, as, as feeding people. So I I feel very strongly that we need to we need to look at the, the whole the food system as a whole, not just whether or not uh, children and indeed people who are in, in food insecurity just getting enough to eat. I don't think that's good enough. And Mary, you were um, taking, making very clear that just handing out a bunch of tins wasn't really something that you felt comfortable with. Do you think that which is, is, is one more important than the other or should they go hand in hand, getting out the, the food or getting the, the nutritional food? I think we all need to make a stand and try and get nutritional food out there, not just for the children, for the parents, mm. just so it, a family can not you know some people take for granted in an evening sitting down and are having a substantially balanced lovely meal i think every family should be able to do that or every single person or every older person as well because a lot of the older people in society they don't have enough money either we, we, I, I'm coming across that more and more in people that just have a state pension, that they're finding to pay everything and to be able to find buy fresh nutritional food, they're struggling. Mm. Jess, how about you? Well, I've learned a lot working with the refugee community that I do around how you can feed yourself nutritionally on a very low budget because it it has made me reflect on how kind of culture and education do play a big part in what people eat like particularly in Britain our national diet is considerably less kind of healthy than a lot of other national diets um so yeah even like a lot of the chefs that I work with are very much living in poverty but when they tell me about what they're feeding their family it will be very nutritional soups and um, but I guess that does come down to education and um, where work like Barney's organisation does of trying to educate communities about how they can cook healthy food is so important. Can we have you? Oh, yes. Um, well, that's partly why we, we started this bus project. And I guess the community shop is a bit of a test uh, test bunny. I don't know what the term is. It's a bit of a test for our our bus. It was a it because we realised that there are places where you can't get you can't buy nutritional food. Places like Tesco local and all the locals, Sainsbury's local. The food is very expensive. So if you can't afford to buy nutritional food, you're not going to buy it. So by offering another way and showing that there's another way that you can do like community shops, maybe not as cheap as. As, as ours, um, what we've seen is that people do make those nutritional choices of their own accord, as long as it fits within their budget. So I, partly maybe some of it is about um, education, but I think a big part of it is about price and cost. And when it comes down to sustainability of the food that we're buying, we definitely keep that in mind and where possible, we make those choices. Right now, it seems that, um, right now it seems that some of the choices that we would normally make we're not able to make because we have to make sure that we can afford the food especially because we're basically giving it away um and other we've had like lots of conversations within our team 
about organic and local and what is local when it comes to London, because it's not really that local and is it that organic? So these are conversations we are constantly always having, making sure that we can balance the price so um, um, for people who are making better choices. Great. We've got three minutes left. So I'm going to ask one. We've got two questions. I'll ask the last one first. I'm sorry if you were the first question and we hopefully we'll get to it. But the last one, I think it, that they could value the panel's advice. It's from Jude, who, who worked with a team of people running a COVID meal service in Surrey. And they offer up freshly cooked meals prepared from surplus foods from supermarkets. They know that in their area, there's a great need in the community, but they're struggling to reach the numbers they know are out there and they know are in need. Can the panel, from their experience, suggest the, an effective way of reaching out and encouraging people in need to accept help and to come to them? And I guess part of that is about the stigma and so forth. So... Um, Kemi, you're, you seem keen to answer that one. Let's start with you and then um, anyone else who has anything to say. I, I'm clapping because I know Jude and he, ah. he <laughs> volunteered with us. He volunteered with us for a year to learn how we ran our projects and then set up our project in Surrey. And I'm so pleased that it's been doing so well. It's like, it's like wonderful. So um, how do you reach people who are hard to reach? You've got to like go to where they are. You've got to um, hand out flyers, speak to um speak to social workers uh go to doctor surgeries um you know very quickly i would say that's how you do it do you, uh, I, I, I agree with kemi i was just going to say i think you need to connect with other organizations and other people who are already in the work i think that's a really strong way and i think that goes for pretty well all, all of this this work that we need to build collaborations and partnerships within our cities and our our communities i think that's a really effective way of increasing your exposure and your kind of the work that you can do with people. And Mary? Yeah, I think you're quite right there. I think uh, for us, it's been, especially in this pandemic, it, we've been so fortunate that we've been able to work with Rich, Richmond Dill Elderly Action, the school, um, Mencap, you know, they've all been, we've just all done it together. And that way, I think you do involve, you do find the hidden poverty, you know, and just walking about your own streets, I think you do over time build up this instinct to know when someone's struggling and you don't make that the point of your first conversation. You just talk about anything and then you really do find, you know, with that encouragement and the trust, you know, it's all about trust mm. that you do find, you know, that you would find the hidden poverty because it's very difficult to tell someone that you're not managing. You feel such a way about yourself. And Jess, how do you uh, find people to work with and how do you find people to learn from them? What, how would you encourage him to reach out and get? Yeah, I guess what comes to mind for me is um, that it's kind of, when the migratory chefs come, they, we're offering them this very kind of uh, dignified way to be involved. So essentially they are yeah. like very impoverished, unemployed, isolated. Um, but what they say is that when they come to train as chefs, they don't feel like a refugee anymore. They don't feel like they have to own that label. So it's, it's kind of finding a way to engage with people so that it doesn't feel like a loss of dignity happens that when they reach out. Um, but yeah, in terms of how we meet our chefs, just through referrals from other refugee charities. Um, yeah. Well, Thank you very much, panel. I can hear the uh, imaginary applause rising to such a degree that it's almost impossible to be heard right now. Um, you can hear the British Library on its feet, but all the same, just to try and shout it out, thank you very much to Emmy Akinoda, to Barry Horton, to Mary Brennan, and to Jess Thompson. And now I think we are about to transfer over to Angela. Is that right? Yes, thank you, Stephen. And thank you to all the panel. What a completely extraordinary powerful event i think you're absolutely right if we're if we're at the library everyone will be absolutely kind of storming the stage a huge thanks to everybody um, there is loads more to come from the british library food season 
On Tuesday, we're continuing conversation about food futures, uh, Carolyn Steele and Kath many thinking about ways we can better understand the value of food. And then next Saturday, we have another double bill. So we have uh, Jack Monroe, Kimberly Wilson, and then Melissa Hemsley and Gelf Alderson. Um, if you would like to support the work of the British Library, there's a donate button on your screen. But for now, huge thanks and goodbye from the British Library food season. <laughs>